everybody, thanks for joining. We'll give a minute or so for folks to get logged in and then we'll get started with our content today. All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. I see a number of folks have already joined, so uh, we'll go ahead and get started today. Um, I'm Jenny Sumner with the National Renewable Energy Lab. Um, we're here today to present C2C's in-depth partnerships uh, request for proposals that is out on the street today. Um, we'll hear from Kevin Lynn at the Department of Energy to kick us off. Um, then I will cover some of the the meat and bones to the RFP uh, solicitation. And we'll also hear from Jeff Soltes at NREL who works in our procurement team. Um, so we could go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, just some quick housekeeping stuff for today. We are recording the webinar. It will be posted as well. Um, so be aware of that. Uh, we are offering a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Uh, we're using the Q&A box in the Zoom feature, so please put your questions in that Q&A box rather than in the chat feature. Um, if you are experiencing any technical issues, please check your audio settings, um, but also just chat us if you're having a persistent technical issue and can't, can't figure it out. Happy to help you guys out. Um, and with that, I will turn over to Kevin Lynn to do just a quick interview if you want to move to the next slide um, about C2C and get us started today. Uh, again, my name is Kevin Lynn and I work at the Department of Energy and I lead the Clean Energy to Communities program from the department. So I want to thank everybody for, for being here. Um, at the highest level, you know, Many people think of the Department of Energy of, of thinking sort of setting national goals and thinking from the top down. And one of the things that really excites me about clean energy communities is it's really a bottoms up approach. Uh, this is probably one of our more exciting, in my opinion, one of our more exciting uh, community place based programs. Uh, it's been a year and a half since the secretary kicked this off in January at the US Con Conference of Mayors. And since then, we've served hundreds of different communities uh, through our variety of different uh, project offerings. But I think this is one of our sort of really important key, key project offerings as part of our, our programs, where we really work directly with you, the communities, and you, you provide the, the strong direction to us, department, and to the national labs about what you want to do for you, you know, setting your goals for your communities over the next several years. Um, we also have programs and cohorts and expert match or things that the, you might, might want to be looking at on our website as well, or on the NREL website as well. But again, uh, I just really want to thank you. This is our second round and, and uh, the first round has been very exciting and we're really looking forward to doing this again with you. And so uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Jenny. Thanks, Jenny. Yep. Thanks, Kevin. Um... Yeah, so we're yeah super excited to be going into this really second year of implementation with C2C. Um, some of the stuff we have done in the first year has really focused on this intersection of different sectors. So not just looking at solar or not just looking at um, mobility challenges, but the relationships between those sectors, which I think is uh, really exciting. Uh, we can move on to the next slide. I wanted to just tee up three different program offers that Clean Energy to Communities has. Um, for this webinar, we will focus on in-depth partnerships, but just want to make sure everybody is aware that um, there are three different program offerings within C2C, and um, there are opportunities to participate in all three right now. Um, focus to, of today is on in-depth partnerships. So these are multi-year arrangements between a community team and a national lab team. And our community team uh, has to consist of a local government, community-based organization, and electric utility. Um, we'll talk more about that, but that team works with a um, pairing of national lab staff, to do lots of things um, ranging from modeling and analysis to um, things like hardware in the loop testing. Um, 
this opportunity is open now. That's why we're having this webinar. Um, and our end date is June 14th. Um, also want to let folks know about peer learning cohorts. So these are shorter term engagements. Um, there's no funding sent out to the participants, um, but what they do is convene regularly over about six months on a specific topic. Um, they learn from each other, they learn from um, experts in the field um, and come away with it with some sort of action plan or next step. Um, so there are opportunities now for cohorts as well. Um, I have a slide on the end uh, that we can can share links uh, for that as well. And then the lightest touch offer we have in C2C is Expert Match. And um, this is a really great program for um, entities that have a short-term specific question um, that they need some support on in order to move forward. Um, it's open to um, local governments, utilities, CBOs, schools, nonprofits, wide range of folks. Um, and this is done on a rolling basis. So if you have a question today, you can go ahead and fill out this very easy web form and um, the team will get started with reviewing that and getting back to you on your submission. Uh, we can move on to the next slide, please. So wanna dig into the in-depth partnership opportunity. That's why we're here today uh, to talk about the open call and also highlight some of the work that has been done in our first year of existing projects. Um, so these partnerships are really, um, yeah, designed to support local governments, utilities, and CBOs working together and um, providing expertise from the national labs to answer their cross-sectoral questions. Um, we want to make sure that that partnership, um, first of all, presents a streamlined application. So we have worked really hard to make this easy for folks to apply. Um, it is an RFP the run out of NREL, and Jeff will talk more about that and that um, kind of the logistics of how that works. Um, but trying to trying to seem, streamline that process. Um, when you participate in a partnership, you get a dedicated national laboratory contact. So we have one person who is the go-between um, between the lab team and the community team. Um, there is up to $500,000 in subcontractor funding available to the community team. Um, and the RFP will ask the submitters to specify how they would use that funding and um, how it would help the community team achieve their goals. Uh, we also provide support on facilitation and community engagement. And then the largest um, piece of the project is really that technical support from the DOE National Laboratory Complex. Um, so in addition to NREL providing support, uh, we have four other national labs. We have Argonne National Lab, Oak Ridge, Pacific Northwest National Lab, and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab that can all work together to provide assistance based on our unique capabilities and skills. Um, some other sort of high level stuff timeline, the proposals are due June 14th. Um, we do require that applicant team to have a minimum of a local government, their electric utility and a community based organization. And then we do select through that competitive RFP process, um, which you'll hear more about at the end. Uh, we can move on to the next slide, please. So I wanted to highlight our first round of partnerships, which are active now to give a sense of, you know, what types of work could be covered under an in-depth partnership with C2C. Um, this is our first set of six, and you'll see that they are communities that vary geographically, and they also vary in size. So ranging from uh, very small Sitka, Alaska, or even Molokai, Hawaii, um, all the way up through um, Chicago um, and Delaware Valley, which is um, the Philadelphia region. Um, the little icons here represents the sectors that are being addressed in those projects. Um, but this also is very much based on, you know, what the needs were that the, these teams identified in their proposals. So, for example, in Molokai, Hawaii, the team on the technical side is really focused on um, doing some modeling of the island grid there and validating specific renewable energy project designs to make sure they meet the resilience goals of that community, 
um, they also work within the requirements that the utility has um, for those projects. Um, another example is in Chicago, um, the primary entity that we're working with there is the Metropolitan Planning Organization. Um, that organization has a goal for net zero transportation emissions. And so there are a lot of interesting questions around, you know, as the transportation system decarbonizes, what impact will that have on the utilities distribution grid? And how can some of those planning activities be done together? Um, so just wanted to provide two quick examples. Uh, we can move on to the next slide. Um, I wanted to highlight just one capability that's available um, for folks who are applying. Um, this capability is called um, the Advanced Research on Integrated Energy Systems or ARIES platform. Um, the way I like to think about it is that it gives us um, as researchers a way to validate energy solutions before they are deployed. And it can do that by um, using a lot of data from real communities um, and creating this green virtual community or a virtual representation of that community. And then we can take physical assets that exist um, at Unreal, but also at other national labs um, and basically plug them into that virtual community, see how they will operate um, test different solutions um, and things like that. So a uh, really cool way to um, envision energy futures and make sure they will work before equipment is purchased or any of those steps are done. Uh, we did note here that, yeah, this capability won an R&D 100 award. That may not mean a lot to most people on this call, but it's um, sort of the, the Oscars of innovation for researchers in the energy space. So I'm super excited that this capability has been recognized in that way. And I think just highlights the, the innovation that it brings to support communities. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I have a couple slides just highlighting a specific use case for this work. Um, NREL worked with Fairbanks, Alaska and the utility there uh, before we launched C2C. Um, and the Fairbanks uh, case really has a, some unique context. Uh, it was really interesting for the team to dig into and to support um, GVEA, which is the Golden Valley Electric Association up there. Um, so up in Fairbanks, they have a, a situation where they are planning to retire about 50 megawatts of coal. They uh, think that they want to replace it with 90 megawatts of wind and some battery storage. Um, their concerns are around um, summer load being, you know, about 100 megawatts and winter load at almost 200 megawatts. Um, they are transitioning to a more um, inverter-based resource grid, and they have a strong reliance on the inner tie. So between GVA, GVEA up in the north um, and this map um, uh, down below to the central area. Um, so they have a lot of unique kind of circumstances and uh, worked with NREL to basically figure out how, how would this transition work. Um, so we can move on to the next slide. Um, there are basically three sort of sets of questions um, that um, came to the, the research team. The first was really focused on production cost modeling. So these are questions like, what size battery and wind do you need? Um, how will those systems affect uh, GVEA's grid and the rest of the connected system? Uh, but moving a layer deeper from that, um, the researchers were also able to look at the stability of the grid under those conditions. So this helps answer questions like, okay, well, we know we need this size of battery, but where do we put it on our system? Um, how might grid stability change with um, this new configuration? Are there considerations for summer or winter conditions? Uh, their considerations for unplanned outages, um, questions like that. And then the last sort of set of questions, digging even deeper into preparing for a procurement or a change is looking at controller validation. So this is where um, ARIES can be used and really answer questions like, um, when we have a control scheme, uh, 
does it work with the existing controller that the utility uses and the existing assets there? Um, really to get to the, to answering the question of like, will it work in the way that um, is intended? So um, this is a really exciting project um, to support the utility and answer some questions that they were having. Um, yeah, as they, they are planning for this transition. Next slide. So I wanna just summarize um, where we're at with Indup partnerships. Uh, we're having our webinar today. Um, there is a follow-up webinar on May 14th. So in that webinar, we'll dig into probably more of the questions that have come in and um, any sort of uh, yeah responses to those questions. Um, the deadline is June 14th and the partnerships will run for about three years. So that's the timeline that we're working with. Um, you can scan this link uh, that'll take you to our in-depth partnership page. Uh, I think Thomas has also been posting links in the chat. So uh, those will both get you to the right place. Um, and then just would encourage questions to go to our general inbox, which is c2c at nrel.gov. Um, we also had a number of questions submitted um, through the webinar as folks registered, so we've captured those as well. Uh, we can move on to the next slide. So I'm going to turn over to Jeff to talk more about the RFP process and, and what that looks like. Um, so I'll turn it over to you, Jeff. Thank you, Jenny. Appreciate that. And hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Soltes. I work in the procurement office here at NREL. And, uh, what you'll notice if you look at the RFP, Kim Lopez is actually the administrator handling this particular procurement. However, she was unable to make it today. And so uh, I jumped at the chance to, to be in part of this webinar and learn a little bit more about this program and hopefully help you understand a little bit about what you need to do for this RFP process. And so this first slide here kind of walks you through the major steps of what we do in our RFP process. I'm going to kind of go through these a little bit for you. Um, as you can see, the first step was we did post the solicitation on SAM.gov. And there'll be a link a little bit later in the slides if you haven't seen that yet, so that make it a little bit easier for you to find. That was posted April 1st. And then what you can do is you can go actually go out there, you can download all the documents, kind of read through it, um, absorb it a little bit, and come up with things like the questions that you might have about it. And so what you're going to see that next step we have is to submit questions to the RFP contact, which will be Kim Lopez. Um, and we're actually going to have two rounds of uh, questions for you on this one. The first round of questions is due tomorrow, 419, and the second round is going to be uh, May 17th. And so what you're going to see is once we get those questions uh, internally, we'll kind of go through those. We'll develop answers to each of those questions. And we typically uh, post an amendment to SAM.gov to provide that information to all parties that are interested in this solicitation. So even if you don't ask a question or, or submit anything for this first round, you'll still get the answers to the questions that everyone has submitted and still get that information so that we can maintain a fair and level playing field for everyone. And so you'll kind of find those out on the SAM.gov, same link that you'll, you'll get the proposal that you can do that. And we'll do that for both rounds so that you'll get those. Um, as we've mentioned a couple of times, the proposals are actually due on June 14th at 5 p.m. Eastern time. And you'll send those into the RFP contact that's listed on, on that first cover page. And they'll uh, collect those uh, basically, we have an internal process where we're going to vet those proposals and make sure that you've submitted everything that was requested. And that's one thing I'll encourage everyone is go through that RFP in detail and make sure that you do submit all of the requested documents. Um, it makes it a lot easier for us to, to get you involved in the process and to evaluate your proposals. And so uh, next step, of course, we're going to submit those to an, uh, what we call a source evaluation team. And uh, that, that'll be a group of different people that will kind of read through the proposals and they will evaluate them on the technical merits and the program factors. And if you're looking for the qualitative merit, you, you can find that in section six of the RFP. Uh, there's kind of a detailed table that lists what they are and kind of what we're looking for you to address. Um, another little tip that I'll give you is when you're writing up your proposal, your technical proposal, make sure that you kind of follow along with those RFP criteria. That always makes it a little bit easier for the reviewers or the set of evalu the evaluation team to kind of go through your proposal and do a better job of evaluating what you're actually proposing and how you stack up those kind of things like that. I also want to point out that there are some unweighted factors that you can find in section eight of the RFP as well. And so definitely pay attention to those and take a look at those as well. 
And basically what you need to know about these two sections is this is really how we're gonna look at your proposal and make our decisions of who we're gonna make these awards to. And so that, that's very important to you. And you definitely wanna follow along with those and make sure that you touch on all those evaluation criteria, especially the ones that are in section six. Once we've gone through that internal process and we've come up with our selections, um, we will make announcements to those people that uh, were selected. Uh, we will, if you were not selected, you will also get an announcement from us and let, letting you know those kinds of things like that. Um, and please know that if you are not selected, we do typically provide feedback on your proposal, where it was, where it was strong, where it could maybe be improved. The idea between, behind that is to let you know where you could improve your proposal so that maybe you'll have a better shot the next time. Um, while we would love to give everyone an award, um, unfortunately, you know, funding is limited and uh, time is limited, resources are limited, so we can't help everyone. But that's kind of why we go through this uh, competitive process for this. Once we made those announcements, we will, of course, work with those that are selected to finalize our negotiations and get that contract put in place for you. And once that contract is signed, that is when the work can actually begin and your interaction with the technical staff will begin, um, lab support will begin, things of that nature there. So uh, next slide, please. A couple of key things I wanna point out about the citation is that uh, the subconscious ceiling amounts are set at 500K, as was mentioned earlier for C2C. Um, I do wanna point out that, that the technical assistance uh, that is provided by the labs is not included in that 500K. And you can see here on this slide that it's anticipated to be up to about 3.5 million for the C2C program. That's not individual per contract, but for the, for the overall amount of awards that we make. Um, dates, of course, for receiving the tech proposal are stated in the RFP. And again, that was uh, June 14th at this point, but I highly encourage everyone to check those amendments when we put them out. Um, no guarantee that those dates will change and, and they may not, but if we do make a change, we would announce that through an amendment to the solicitation as well, and that would be posted on SAM.gov. So make sure you check those out, get the latest information, and that you're responding in a timely manner. Um, this other programmatic factors like geographic diversity, sectors, et cetera, um, that's what I was talking about in section eight of the RFP, the non-weighted factors. And it's just another way that we kind of uh, use to filter out and make different selections so we can, we can kind of spread a little bit of the, uh, the work across the country and help different communities uh, and things of that nature. And so that's kind of why we use those programmatic factors. Next slide, please. This slide here kind of talks about who's eligible and what we're really expecting out of the team. And as we mentioned before, um, you know, the, the interior blue circle, that's kind of what we're expecting to be the core of the team that is submitting, the local government, the eligible utilities, uh, or community-based organizations. We kind of expect that to be part of the team that actually submits this proposal or is the lead. And then the outer ring, that's additional relevant stakeholders. These are things um, that you may want to consider as you know, being part of your team or at least contributing to your project or, or in your proposal. Um, they are not required, but certainly is something that you would want to consider. And we would definitely encourage you to have conversations with those groups or those types of individuals to see really what's going on in your community and what can make your proposal better. Uh, please note that the, uh, the additional relevant stakeholders, they cannot receive project funding. We're only really looking to provide funding to that core group in the blue circle in the interior. Next slide, please. And this slide here, just kind of a link to the solicitation itself, and also another link where you can get information about the RFP. And when you go into SAM.gov and you find the solicitation, what you'll see is that picture on the right. That's really kind of the introductory or the cover page of the RFP in SAM. And uh, we couldn't show it here because it's kind of a longer page, but if you scroll down, there'll be links to the actual RFP letter, um, our sample subcontract, some of the different forms and things of that nature. And so again, I highly encourage everyone to take a look at that RFP, get familiar with it, kind of digest a little bit and submit questions for the two rounds of different questions that you have. Again, we will answer all of those questions and, and anything question that we don't get to today, we can certainly include in one of those amendments as well. Um, but check back occasionally on that RFP site to see if there has been an amendment to change some of the information or change some of the due dates or things of that nature. Um, and with that, that's all that I brought for you as far as the slides today for, for the RFP itself. Um, I'll still be on the line. I'll be glad to help with any questions that come up in the Q&A. Uh, but with that, I will turn it back over to Jenny. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Um, yeah, before we dig into q and I um, wanted to just provide two quick slides on our other C2C opportunities. Um, so I mentioned these briefly at the beginning, but um, the first um, other opportunity is peer learning cohorts. We have three upcoming topics. Um, the first is on designing and enhancing energy efficiency programs for residential buildings. The second is on charting a path to municipal fleet electrification. And the third is for implementing an agrovoltaics project. So um, these are the next topics that are open for application right now. Um, the application for these is a web form and um, the deadline is April 30th. Um, if folks do have questions on these, I think we, we probably won't get to them today, but um, you can submit questions to c2c at nrl.gov on cohorts um, or check out the website. Um, and then on the next slide, we have uh, just a reminder about expert match. So if your organization, you know, maybe isn't, isn't quite ready for a two to three year end up partnership, uh, maybe you haven't quite figured out what what specific or in-depth support you might need, uh, would encourage you to apply to Expert Match. Um, it is designed to be an easy application web form um, and provides 40 to 60 hours of support um, over a three month time period. Um, there are a lot of topics that can be addressed through Expert Match, basically anything that falls in the renewable energy and energy efficiency space. Um, so we've seen a lot of questions in the clean electricity space, buildings, mobility. Um, we've also touched on um, financing issues, um, environmental or energy justice questions and more. So very broad in terms of who can apply and what types of questions we can answer, um, but really focused on what is that immediate question that an entity might have. Um, so with that, I think we can uh, move on. And yeah, just as a reminder, Lots of links for you guys. Uh, lots of information is up on the web, um, but please do just email our, our inbox if there's something you can't find or you have a specific question. Uh, we can, can use the c2c at nrl.gov for that. Um, and with that, yeah, I think we're ready to move into Q&A. So Thomas Young from our comms team is gonna help us walk through some questions. Thanks, Jenny. Yeah, and we have a lot of questions coming in, which is great. Uh, Right before we get into that, though, we do have a quick poll question we're going to bring up here. Uh, so, Derek, if you can go ahead and bring that one up. All right, here we go. So the poll question, it's just, do you think you're going to apply for in-depth partnerships? We're just kind of curious to get a sense from all of you. Uh, so the answers or responses there, yes, no, maybe. We'll leave that up for just a minute. It looks like responses are coming in pretty fast, which is great. Um. Okay, and so, yeah, for all those who are listening, maybe we definitely uh, hope to answer whatever questions you might still have about this program. I should flag, as uh, Jeff mentioned, we do make amendments. Um, there are time timelines for that. So these questions can help inform that. So just keep an eye out for that. And any questions that we're unable to answer today, uh, as Jenny mentioned earlier, there's a follow-up webinar on May 14th. I put the link to register for that. Uh, in the chat. So please join us there if any of your questions were unanswered today. We'll make sure to get to the rest of them. Okay, and it looks like responses have slowed there. Uh, but the question again, do you think you will apply for enough partnerships? Yes, 32%. No, 18, maybe 49. Okay. All right, thank you for that. Okay, so we'll go ahead and start getting into these questions here. Um, okay, and we have a few people on hand to answer these. Let's see. So one of the first ones, just how can state governments apply or help with this program? Um, Jenny, is that one you'd want to take or maybe? I can Jeff take that. Okay. Um, yeah, I can take that. Jeff, please correct me if I get anything wrong. But um, yeah, states are not um, part of the core team that would receive funding under this opportunity. Um, but that said, we have engaged with some states who would like to support their utilities and local governments and CBOs kind of coming together for a proposal. Um, so a couple states have offered through their energy office or another agency to sort of help support on writing an application or you know bringing people together who might want to apply. 
Um, so we've seen that as a role. Also just promoting it to your uh, organizations within your state um, is always helpful. Um, but yeah, we don't see a, the state as being a uh, part of that core project team. Thanks, Jenny. While we have you here, I have another question. Looks like you can answer. Um, so looking at the National Renewable Energy Labs Energy Transitions Initiative Partnership Program, that's known as ETIP, uh, they're looking at this for an island community in the Chesapeake Bay. Can you speak to how this program, how the CSEs and depth partnerships would interface with that program? Yeah, um, yeah, we actually have two projects in this first cycle that um, are in locations where there's both a C2C project and an ETIP um, project running at the same time or similar timeframes. Um, so the way we've handled that uh, for those two cases is looking at basically what's, you know, what's the mission of the ETIP or ETI um, project and then what's the goal of the C2C project and making sure um, obviously that we're using resources wisely and not um, doing the same thing um, and really developing a coordinated um, team on both the community side and the lab side so that um, it's almost like one big project um, instead of two separate efforts. Um, those are I think specific cases that have evolved um, and I think yeah, we, we would work through any um, challenges around uh, coordinating with other projects in the community, whether they're ETIP or other DOE funded work um, to make sure yeah, the support is um, comprehensive and not um, duplicating efforts. Great, thank you. And Jenny, I'm not sure if you can answer this one, maybe this is for Jeff, uh, but what other criteria are there for participation, like size of community or number of households, uh, and does the community need to work with Department of Energy? Um, yeah, I can take that. Um, so we don't have criteria related to the size of the community. Um, yeah, there's no restrictions. So I think from our first round, you can see that, yeah, we've had very small communities up to very large uh, metropolitan regions. Um, we do have some programmatic factors and Jeff, maybe you wanna just speak to those again, but um, in terms of working with DOE, um, the funding for clean energy to communities is from DOE. So um, the, the structure of that is that Department of Energy funds NREL and NREL is running the solicitation um, using those DOE dollars. So um, definitely have yeah, interaction with DOE and DOE can help us um, also figure out if there's other work going on in that community and yeah, provide some other connection points. But yeah, Jeff, do you wanna to speak to those programmatic factors for selection? Sure, I'd be glad to. So a couple of things that we've got in there, of course, is location of communities. Um, one thing we don't wanna do is like end up funding two or three projects in one city or one tight knit area. We do wanna spread this out a little bit. <clears throat> so we can have a little bit bigger impact across the country. Um, another one that was listed there is diverse range of communities. So, you know, we don't, we don't want to just work in large cities. We don't want to just work in small communities. We kind of want to figure out what works in all different sizes, things of that nature. So that's, that's one of the reasons why you don't really see a limit on the size of your community or a number of households, things of that nature. Because a, a solution that works for Chicago might not really be realistic for a small town or something of that nature. And the reverse is true as well. Um, technology balance is another one that's listed. So, you know, we want to see which different technologies work in your ears. W wind may not work for every location. Uh, geothermal may not work for every location. So we want to kind of take a look at what would work in different areas, things of that nature. Um, another one that's listed is previous or current work with Department of Energy. Um, you know, we see we we aim to encourage communities that may not typically receive from the Department of Energy to apply for some of these programs as well. So we can get a little bit better scope and a little bit better outreach, things of that nature. And well as programmatic fit, you know, um, is the project that you really want to get into and, and be involved with something that we can actually help with or something that we can really have the knowledge and skills to assist with. And so those are some of the things that I think we're looking at as far as the, the unweighted factors that would help someone get selected or, or kind of 
show you really if your project would be something that would be considered or, or be a good fit for this. Thanks, Jeff. And I have a more specific question here. I'll see if you can answer this one. It says, our community is planning to launch a cross-sector innovation lab involving utilities and industry and academics to provide clean energy vehicle uh, on highway and off-highway testing. They're saying that's a gap in the region, uh, the lack of testing. Do you think this would be a suitable project for this RFP? You know, I think we did we did list mobility as one of the uh, areas that we could take definitely help with or take a look at. And I think that, that is something that communities struggle with in some places. And so, uh, uh, you know, certainly I think it would more than likely be a viable project. Uh, whether it would get selected or not is hard to say because that kind of depends on what other proposals come in and what other things fit the programmatic factors. But, but I think, you know, I definitely encourage everyone, if you've got an idea that's out there, you know, let's, let's try to develop that proposal and get it in. Um, you never know until you, until you really submit it and get some of that feedback or get selected. So I would highly encourage everyone to, you know, take that chance, uh, develop that proposal, put that idea out there and, and let us take a look at it and see what fits or what would work best. Perfect. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, let's see. I have another question. This one might be best for uh, Brian, commenter here at NREL. This is about the ARIES platform that Jenny mentioned earlier. And the question is, is ARIES available to any community or only the ones awarded through this RFP? Yeah, thanks. Uh, great question. Um, ARIES is available beyond C2C, um, but it is a fairly complex system to use. So it's not something an external stakeholder could access truly independently. Um, some other ways to access areas would be to include it as part of the scope for a very wide range of other DOE proposals, um, normally in partnership with the labs um, or potentially by directly partnering with INREL. Um, you know, that said, C2C, these in-depth partnerships are a straightforward way to collaborate and they have a substantial amount of uh, technical assistance funding that can go towards areas as if it is a, a, a relevant for supporting the community team needs. So. Uh, CDC is a great way to get involved with areas, but it's certainly not the only way. Thanks, Brian. And we have a handful more questions that are sp project specific, which I think Jeff was kind of getting at, but one that might help answer a handful of questions here is what is the expected role of CBOs, so community-based organizations, and do they need to have 501c3 status? Um, Jeff, can you help answer that one? Jenny, you might help with that. Oh, one. I can take it too. Yeah. Okay. Oh, go, go ahead, Jenny, and I'll, I'll add on if there's anything I need to throw in there. Yeah. Um, so we wanted to make sure that community based organizations are incorporated into the project team because of their direct connection to stakeholders in the community, whether that's uh, residential populations or um, just other organizations within the local community. Um, we don't have a requirement that they be a C3 organization, um, but we do basically, you know, look to the applicant to describe how they qualify as a community-based organization. Um, what does that, you know, what does that engagement look like? Um, things like that. Um, for the, the current set of six projects, um, the community-based organizations often um, do things like convening stakeholders, um, working with the utility and the local government to help um, understand what the community's vision looks like and what the specific questions are that the lab team can be responsive to. Um, but Jeff, anything I missed there? Or, yeah, clarifications. No, I think that's a good answer, Jenny. And um, a couple of things that I would maybe add in there is see. Part of it depends on uh, what role the community-based organization is going to take. If they're going to be the lead on the proposal or in the contract, we probably want something that's a little bit more of a formal business organization. Not necessarily that it has to be a 501c3, but we would probably want to see something that's a little bit more established and, and has a track record. A couple of things we need to look at, procurement is responsibility of the organization, um, different things of that nature. So we would want to see some type of at least establishment with that organization. But but I agree with you. I see the community-based organizations that's kind of the voice of the people that live in that community. And they kind of are, are a little bit closer, maybe can bring up what those people are really struggling with or what they really need to make their community better. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, I have a, I have a two-part question here related to eligibility. Um, first one, or the first part of the question is, 
This community has an existing group that includes members from the city and county. There's a convening nonprofit and a utility representative. Uh, would that be sufficient evidence of participation from all these or do they need specific letters of intent or something similar from each entity? And, and then the follow-up question there is, what is the definition of eligible utility? I'm happy to repeat that, but Jenny, Jeff, either of you want to take that one? I, I can certainly touch on a little bit of it. Uh, you know, uh, we do mention in the RFP that letters of support uh, or letters of intent, um, those are kind of encouraged. We kind of want to know that you have the backing of the, of the main players in your community. Um, and by the way, those do not count against your page count for your technical proposal. Uh, they're kind of included as just what, with the resumes and things of that nature. And so certainly having that, it kind of lends a little bit more credence to your proposal. Um, and just to show that there is a little bit more uh, serious backing or, or, or you know, uh, support for what this program or what this project that you're proposing would do. So, Jenny, anything you would add to that? Um, no, I think, yeah, I think you covered it. Great. Okay. I have, I have another question on here asking if we can better explain what the subcontractor budget can be used for. I can certainly take that one. Um, what you're going to kind of see there is uh, I think the idea from what I've seen in this RFP is we really want to pay more for like time or labor. Uh, for the organizations to really come up with this plan, uh, do community outreach, you know, work back and forth between the entities and with the labs to, to really develop this plan or how they want to go about implementing this project. Um, so anything that involved in that labor or the, to support those individuals' time to, to go out and do those activities, uh, certainly there can be some material supplies uh, you know, a website, those kind of things like that to get that message out, to help coordinate different things. Uh, we can certainly support that with the funding as well. Uh, so certainly anything in that type of an area, we, we can certainly do that. Uh, the, the one thing that I can tell you that we really cannot use uh, the government funds for is equipment. Um, what you'll kind of see is that uh, if you if we use taxpayer funds to to, per, to for towards equipment, it becomes government property. We would have to get it back at the end of the project. And I think most entities, they wanna keep that equipment after going forward with this. And so uh, that is kind of one restriction we have, but, but anything as far as the labor to help, you know, get this program out there to develop the plan, work through the plan and the details of that, to work with the different labs, um, to get that support, certainly willing to support those types of activities. And again, any type of outreach materials or materials needed to help coordinate community events to, to figure out what they need to do or things of that nature would certainly be open. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, I have another one here. Uh, would the exploration of the feasibility of a transition to development uh, for microgrid for municipality be something that would be pertinent here? Uh, Follow-up is, if so, if a national lab is within the footprint of that municipality's potential microgrid, is there any conflict of interest having that lab serving as the technical advisor? Or could that serve as a benefit for such a project and its application? Jenny, is that one you might be able to take or Brian? I can take it or Brian, do you wanna take it? Either way. Yeah, I can get started. Uh, certainly the technical topic sounds like it could be uh, really a relevant topic. Uh, of course, you know, assuming that the full team uh, and the community angles are, are all um, consistent with what's required for the CUC uh, program. Um, I, I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer the sort of uh, logistics of the national lab piece. I, I don't, it certainly wouldn't be a conflict of interest as I understand it, but I'll, I'll let someone who's more directly on that side answer. Um, yeah, maybe I could just add that um, we don't require applicants to um, identify the lab that they would want to have supporting them for technical assistance. Um, we sort of figure that out as we scope the projects. And I think that would be a, the phase if this project were awarded where we would need to, yeah, just dig into what the national lab's role would be. Great. Okay. Let's see. It's Abbott. Timeline question here. When are awards to successful applications expected to be announced? And how long to finalize the contracts and get the ball rolling? Uh, if you can base that on previous experience, previous projects. So, so I can take that one. Um, uh, it kind of varies a little bit. It's hard to put an exact timeline on it because 
Uh, one of the unknowns is we don't know how many proposals that we're going to get. And the larger the number of proposals, the longer it takes for this source evaluation team to get through those. And uh, I'm sure everyone understands that you want us to do or give adequate time to each proposal to really consider it, dig into it a little bit and, and you know, do a good job of evaluating really what is being offered in that proposal. So that's one thing that kind of can extend the timeline a little bit is just the sheer number that we have to go through the volume. Um, another thing that kind of extends the timeline is if there are any exceptions taken to the terms and conditions that we typically apply to a contract. So certainly, you know, working through that process, um, it can take a little more time as well. It also really depends on who is leading the, the program team. Working with the municipality, um, there are usually some different things that come into play there, whether they need to go to a city council or some type of a government board to get things approved. Those typically used to take a little bit longer than, say, with a, uh, a utility or, or a community business leader organization, that type of a thing like that. Um, one thing I'll tell you is that typically what we try to strive for is once we have a selection, we've got announcements out there, we try to get contracts in place within 30 days, 30 to 45 days is typically what you're going to see on that. But again, depending upon how many um, proposals we have to go through, that will extend that selection time. And the different entities that come up or the different exceptions to terms and conditions can certainly extend that 30 to 45 days a little bit longer. But uh, in general, um, <clears throat> we get most of these in place within 90 days and in most cases. But there are some exceptions that do take a little bit longer. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, I have a few questions here about eligibility uh, and working with utilities. Uh, this first one here is, can a community organization partner with two different municipal or utility groups on two different applications. So awesome. yeah, one community organization, two applications, two different utilities. I was gonna say, I didn't see anything in the RFP that limited to just one proposal per organization. Um, and we have done that in the past. Uh, I think that we would wanna see those to be like separate projects or sep you know, separate really ideas maybe. Um, and you would define those each independently in the proposals that you submitted, but I don't see any reason why you couldn't do that. Great. Okay. So similar here, could multiple smaller, uh, well, yeah, because multiple smaller localities apply together. Um, I, I think if it were within a, a region, I think that that would probably work out as far as how the RFP is set up. Um, if there was quite a gap or spread, like I don't think like somebody in New York could partner with somebody in California, unless they were, you know, very similar and had very similar geographic tendencies or characteristics, things of that nature, where the same solutions would work in both. But, uh, but I'd kind of kick that over to, to anyone on the technical team to see what they thought about that as far as being a feasible option as well. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, you know, we have envisioned this community team as being uh, very place specific. So the local government working with the utility that serves that local government and community-based organizations in that utility service territory. Uh, but I, you know, I think uh, utility service territories can be big sometimes. So if it were, um, you know, maybe two local governments within the same service territory where the utility is covering them both, that would have strong alignment with, you know, how we've envisioned these projects. Um, but yeah, I agree with Jeff, your comments about, you know, if it's a New York City and a San Francisco, that's really not um, how the RFP is, yeah, designed to focus. Okay. And another here is this, is clean energy communities limited to municipal and cooperative utilities only? Um, it is not. So, um, yeah, in this first round, we have um, representation of diverse utility regulatory types. Um, our one restriction is that um, we do not send funding out to investor-owned utilities. So they can be part of that core project team, but they would not receive funding. Uh, whereas we can send funding out to a municipal utility or a cooperative utility. Okay, great. Um, let's see. I'm going to read this one. It says, as the as a private entity startup company, it seems the only way to participate in C2C is if we collaborate with the local government, utilities, or universities to be the subcontractor 
um, if they, but they would lead the application. Is that right? So, so based that, on, Jeff. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say, based, based on what I saw in the RFP, um, you know, we're looking for the, those three members to be the core team. And so as a private entity, um, you, that really wasn't listed as somebody that would lead that proposal. Now, what, what I would suggest to those types of organizations is, you know, get in touch with your municipality or, or your um, utility. And there, there's no reason why you can't be the one that actually writes it, writes that proposal or kind of comes up with the actual documents. And then you can have them kind of submit that for you. Um, just because you're leading a project doesn't mean you wrote up the idea is basically what I would put out there. So there are different ways to, to go through that and, and be, be a member of that team and be part of it especially if there's something you think that would work well for your community and that would be beneficial. Great. Um, here's a question asking for some examples of how the Department of Energy lab funds are applied in support of a project. Um, and does this include procurement of clean energy systems? So the, um, the one thing I was talking about earlier is that we, we cannot spend taxpayer dollars on equipment. So the procurement of an energy system is, is really not kind of on the table for this particular subcontract. From what I read, this is more really coming up with the plan, the designs, those kind of things like that um, for this particular type of a, a solicitation. And so, so the purchasing of the equipment probably would not be covered under this contract, but will help you. It's my understanding, Wayne, and, and let me know if this is a little bit off. Um, but as we are going to provide that technical expertise to figure out what would work in your community, what would be most beneficial, what would be most efficient, the way to set it up, how to integrate it, those types of things like that. Would uh, Jenny and Brian, would you kind of agree with that? Or? Yeah, I think that's right. That, um, you know, it's 500, up to 500K for the community team. And at that scale, yeah, we would want to see things like, uh, you know, staff time or labor time, stuff like that to really help um, let the technical team know the right direction to go in and be responsive to the questions that the community has and, and focusing on that piece of work. Yeah, I think you covered it well. It, it does seem like there's a lot of opportunity for helping support. You know, if you look at the total budget size, there's opportunity for a significant amount of uh, support from the lab space, but to make that support as effective as possible likely requires some funding and within the community too. So I think that balance is, is where you can find those nice synergies. Okay, Jenny, I think this next question is for you. It asks, uh, well, it says, our group is currently pursuing an EPA community change grant funding opportunity in order to develop a clean renewable energy project to benefit many of the disadvantaged communities located near the US-Mexico border within the U, within UMA, Arizona. Can we also simultaneously apply for this C2C FOA? Or is the current funding round for the specifics uh, program only intended to be applied to Alaska and other US Northern and East Coast communities? Um, yeah, I could take that. Um, yeah, we are certainly not restricted to certain geographies. So anybody in the US, um, including territories, um, please do consider yourself, you know, eligible for this opportunity. Um, yeah, we can, uh, we also don't have restrictions. You know, if you have a, a proposal out somewhere else that doesn't disqualify you for this work, um, the piece we need to be careful about is just, you know, if you're funded to do the same thing under two different projects, that's, um, that's where we get into problems. So um, I think the, yeah, the questions we would want to focus in on for C to C or some of the stuff I covered in the intro, like what are the cross sector questions? So maybe how does renewable energy interact with the grid and buildings and mobility in a specific location um, or things like that. And um, as Jeff was just saying, you know, we're not we're not providing funding for the actual project, the renewable energy project or uh, mobility solution, but really providing a lot of in-depth technical assistance to figure out what is that solution, um, how can we validate it and make sure it will work before um, equipment is purchased and installed. Great. Okay. Uh, one question about uh, barriers to finding partnerships here. It says, we are a nonprofit and a big barrier to moving forward is getting the utility to speak to the community to figure out viability. Is there any help available to facilitate these discussions? 
Yeah, we don't have, maybe I'd take a pass at it, but Jeff would welcome your suggestions. Um, we don't have any like formal support for um, creating teams or um, facilitating discussions. Um, um, I would say sometimes questions like this do come in through expert match and that might be a good fit to um, sort of answer questions like, you know, where where do I need to work with my utility on specific questions or things like that? So we can definitely do that in expert match, but for the RFP opportunity, yeah, we don't have a, a structure to support that creation of the team. So Jenny, you are correct on that. In, in an RFP situation, we actually kind of need to stay at an arm's length. Um, and, and really what it comes down to is we need to be fair to all parties. And so we, we're not really allowed to get involved with how to structure your team or helping you put that team together. Unfortunately, that has to come from the entities that are proposing. And, and really what it gets into is if we help one team, then we would have to help everybody that wants to propose. And, and uh, that could, could be a, a really drain on our resources. And, and so that's why we've always kind of traditionally taken the approach of, of just staying out of that part of the actual solicitation process. See here, uh, was there something else there? Nope, okay. Uh, another here, could a school district qualify as a CBO or community-based um, organization? Uh, I mean, we, we were fairly loose in the uh, RFP of describing what a community-based organization was. So um, I, I don't see why a school district couldn't be. I mean, they certainly have the voice of a certain members of that community. And they're certainly probably in touch with uh, some of these struggles and things that are going on there or some of the issues that they would need to deal with. And so I, I don't see why they would be disqualified from that at all. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's see. Um, looks like Jenny, I have another one here for you. It says some utility information is confidential because of Homeland Security concerns. How is this addressed in projects? Yeah, for our projects, we put in place a non-disclosure agreement. It's one of our first first things we go through as a, a project team. Um, we know that, yeah, there's often a lot of data that utilities have that is confidential and their regulators, you know, have specific provisions requiring confidentiality. So, um, yeah, we, we put in place NDAs between um, entities on the community side who would need access to data, the utility and the lab researchers and, and talk through, you know, what types of data might be needed and who needs access to what, basically what level of detail. Um, sometimes not all parties need um, a, a complete or granular data set, but they're comfortable just reviewing something at a higher level or something that is um, anonymized. So um, yep, definitely deal with a lot of confidential data and um, yeah, work through the NDA process to handle that. And if I could just kind of tack on to yeah. that a little bit, uh, Jenny, you are correct. And if, uh, if when you go through the RFP uh, letter itself, there is a section in there that kind of lets you know the proper way to deal with uh, proprietary or confidential information that you're gonna include in your proposal. Um, in general, what I would tell you is not to get too deep into that proprietary information. Sometimes you do need to include some details of that just so that the evaluators will understand what you're talking about. But, but there are ways to mark your proposal and call that out. And as long as you do that and do that in a proper manner, we will protect that information and that data for you. Great. Uh, let's see. So we are just about out of time here. We have quite a few questions remaining. Um, I think maybe... See, I have we've had a few come in just the last minute. Um, I think, Jenny, maybe it's best now to wrap it up since we're at the end of the hour. Um, I would refer people back to the In-Depth Partnerships website, so I'll put that in here. I may put a couple more resources in the chat as well, but Jenny, if there's anything you want to close with, I'll let you go ahead and do that. Yeah, um, no, I'll just close with, I yeah, appreciate everybody tuning in today and learning about this opportunity. Um, we're super excited to see applications come in for the next round and um, all the cool ideas that are probably percolating in your brains um, over the last hour. So 
Um, we'll keep following up to answer questions, um, but please, yeah, send anything to the c2c at nrel.gov inbox. And um, yeah, I just want to thank everybody for joining today.